It's a day where dreams come true. Years of preparation, development, and triumph culminate in one moment, etched in time on the cusp of being drafted into the ranks of professional baseball, hoping one day the show will call. Welcome, everybody, to this Draft Week edition of the Cleanup Spot presented by Baseball Essential. My name is Gershon Rabinowitz. I'm joined by Brian Dana. And at this time on Monday, the first round of the Major League Baseball Draft for the 2015 season will be complete. 1,200 players in total will be drafted across 40 rounds over the next few days. Complete coverage will be on MLB Network for the first round. And then after that, on MLB.com with live webcast, everything about the Major League Draft. It's one of the most exciting times of the year, Brian, because you have the short season leagues coming up, some of these minor league teams. Those guys are going to immediately get into those teams. You're going to see them start playing. Some of these guys will be in the big leagues probably in about a year from now. We had it last year with Jacob Lindgren, Carlos Rodon. They're already in the major leagues. It's just such an exciting time, and I always enjoy this time of year. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 a great time of year. Um, uh, you know, this is actually the 50th anniversary of the MLB draft. The first draft was in 1965, so... 2015 makes 50 years, and um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of intriguing players in this draft. Um, there's a lot of history to this draft that we can that we'll talk about. Um, a lot of great moments in these last 50 years of the draft, and um, it's exciting because you know we see all these players on the field now who were drafted just a few years ago, and they're making such big impacts in the game now. And um, you never know if if the next Mike Trout is out there, or the next. Clayton Kershaw, or you just never know if this draft or this pick is really going to make such a big difference, you know, and can change the course of history for a franchise. It's really exciting, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And this year, some people say that this draft is not very top-heavy with superstar-type players, but there's a lot of good steady players and guys that could have long big league careers, but you never know. When you make projections, usually you're wrong, and as John Sterling would probably say on the radio, you can't predict <laughs> baseball, and you nope. really can't predict this type of draft, there's a lot of people that are saying that Brendan Rodgers could go first overall, the kid out of Lake Mary High School, Dansby Swanson, many people think from the Arizona Diamondbacks out of Vanderbilt because they think that he could be signed pretty early. That could be an option. You have Dylan Tate, who could be the top pitcher from U- from UC Santa Barbara. Carson in Palmer. In the high 90s, Daz Cameron. Eagles landing, he is the son of Mike Cameron. He could be another option that's out there, Carson Fulmer. The team, the teammate of Dansby Swanson at Vanderbilt. A lot of great names out here. Which one stick to your mind that you're thinking of that could either go drafted in the top ten that you like, or somebody that is a wild card that step in and just really surprise everybody? Well, um, you know there there are a lot of names. Um, I've watched film on quite a lot of these guys. Um, a, a popular pick by many is Tyler Stevenson, the catcher out, out of uh, Georgia. Um, he has, uh, you know, an amazing bat, um, solid defense. Um, Dansby Swanson, you know, it's funny because baseball has kind of shifted back. You know, a few years ago, first base was kind of the position in demand that was hard to find, hard to find solid players in that position. Now it's really shortstop. There's only a handful of guys in the majors. And even in the minor leagues, you can point to, as, as, as solid shortstops and, and people who will stay in that position and hit well. Um, Dansby Swanson is one of those guys who people are projecting to be um, a great shortstop in baseball. Uh, not a power hitter, but, but a high average guy, high on base percentage guy. People say his defense is great. He has soft hands. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to like there. Um, I am very intrigued by Carson Palmer. I read a lot about him out of Vanderbilt. Um, his delivery, if you ever watch film, is very interesting, very aggressive. Um, not not to not to cast dispersion, but it looks like one of those deliveries that that will result in some sort of arm injury down the line. So you have to be careful with that. But Carson Palmer's stuff is nasty. He was drafted um, a few years ago as as a as a, as a high schooler, um, but he did not sign. Um, I think it was the 15th round pick. So now he, he he's back up. Uh, people are looking at him as a top three pick. Funny though, because this, this is the first draft in a while. You know, last year of course was Brady Aiken. Um, years before, you know, you had Steven Strasburg, Bryce Harper, clear number one pick, clear cream of the crop guys above the rest. Um, this year's draft is really a toss-up. I, I think any of the top ten players could really be flip-flopping and could be 
you know, I mean, uh, Dansby Swanson could be a Diamondback at the first pick, or he could be a uh, Philly at the 10th pick. I mean, I, it's really interchangeable, in my opinion. I'm seeing a lot of these different guys in in the draft, when you look at these different mock drafts, I saw Garrett Whitley, who looked like he was going to be a middle-round pick. Latest ones I'm seeing, I, I saw some I saw some top 10 on him. He's a 5 tool guy, New York kid from this year in high school. He could be a top pick in this draft. That was, that was re- very surprising because he really just jumped off the board. Kyle Funkhauser is another guy that he could be, you know, throws all four pitches. Looks like that he could be an ace for a team. He's from Louisville. Brady Aiken, I don't know where he's going to go. Some people probably will have him a little bit higher in the draft. I've seen a lot of projections, mid-20s, maybe into the supplemental round. Where do you see Brady Aiken going? Um, well, I mean, just taking a quick look at uh, a few box drafts, a lot of people seem going to go into the back end of the first round. Um, it's kind of interesting because, obviously, um, he had Tommy John surgery in April, I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken. And apparently a lot of people described it as not a typical Tommy John surgery, which is kind of scary. Um, people say there was something even more wrong with his ligament, um, and that's that, that cause for concern. And um, it's pretty interesting to think that Brady Aiken could still get drafted so highly. Um, in this draft. I mean, he was obviously thought of very well, and people thought he would be great if he was healthy. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it's a given, but when a pitcher, when a proven major leaker goes down with Tommy John surgery, it's, it's, it's pretty safe to assume that if we have goes well, he'll be back on the mound doing close to what he had done before. But with a guy like Brady Aiken, I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, a, a young, a young, young kid um, and and no one knows that if, if rehab will 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 keep his stuff intact. And um, it, it's unfortunate because Brady Aiken was supposed to really really be a solid pick last year. Um, and I mean I think he'll still get drafted, but I mean I'm not going to look too much into him. Um, I'm more just looking I mean all around and other all these other guys who are proven to be healthy and proven to be you know good you know that they're going to make an impact. They're going to play in short season season leagues. Um, this summer, so I mean that that it's, that that is what I'm really looking at, and um, there's a lot of good arms in this draft. You know, Tyler J is someone who's who, people are looking at out of Illinois. John Harris, you even mentioned, uh, you know, Garrett Whitley. Um, lot, lot, lot. Oh, Garrett Whitley's an outfielder. Sorry. Yeah, you're thinking you're thinking Chase, Whitley, Chase the Whitley, the guy who yeah. went down for Tommy John surgery. But yeah, yeah Garrett, but... Garrett Whitley's an outfielder. I'm thinking also of Demi Arumaloy, who is an outfielder for St. Matthews High School in Ottawa. We actually had him on Baseball Essential a couple of months ago. Jack McNeil spoke to him. Five to a player. He he could really help a lot of teams. There's not that much outfield depth in this draft, at least in the first round. He could probably be a mid-round pick, maybe even getting close to the top ten with some of the tools that he has. As a high school bat around the age of 18, lots of upside with Aruba. You know it's pretty funny to look at, too? Um, this season, um, I mean, as we all know, you know, the Houston Astros are playing their best baseball since 2005 when they won the NL pennant, I think it's safe to assume. And, you know, we're into June now, and they're keeping it up. And, and so are the Minnesota Twins. And here you are, the Astros have the second pick and the fifth pick. Um, a lot of players are skewed from there. They're going to get another solid franchise cornerstone player, you would imagine. Uh, don't know who it's going to be exactly. Um, in fact, the Astros today announced, or you know, we're recording this Sunday night. You know, they are they are in fact calling up Carlos Correa, the 2012 first round over, number one overall pick, who Jack McNeil spoke to as well in 2013. Um, the Astros have a amazing opportunity where, if they are legit for this season, to think of them adding two more solid top of the line prospects into that minor league system, that's a scary thought. Um, same with the Twins at number six. You know, they have a they have potential to really draft a guy. You know, right now this team, the, the Twins this season, and, you know, looking ahead, they're, 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 they don't have um, too many elite prospects outside of Byron Buxton. Um, you know, so this is a great opportunity for them as well. I mean, um, and even at the Cubs, number nine, as I said, you know, the, uh, a lot of these teams who, who have the top picks are playing well this season and are already in good shape for the future. So, this is a great opportunity for all of them to really get a leg up on each other. If you look at the Boston Red Sox, they're picking seventh overall because they had a disappointing season last year. They're, they look like they're pretty stacked in the minor league system. So if they could add a position player, they add somebody long range in the future, that could be a big pick for them at number seven. Yeah, 
that, that, that is definitely – it's amazing to see them throw high up on the draft again because, you know, I just remember um, it was a few years ago, um, 2013, when they drafted, I think it was Trey Ball, yeah, his starting pitcher. Um, you know, I think they had it the fourth or fifth pick, and it, it, it's amazing to see them back up here a year after, a few years after winning the World Series. But, um, yeah, as you said, their minor league system is stacked. They have a lot of solid uh, position players. Um, last thing on the pitching side, though, uh, you know, they called up Eduardo Rodriguez, of course, and he's had a great start to his career. A uh, great couple of starts. Um, but obviously starting pitching is something they're in desperate need for. That's why they have this makeshift, pretty awful rotation, because they simply had no one in the minor leagues who were really ready. So um, I would be I would expect the Red Sox to draft a starting pitcher, um, and and they are in, in, in big need for one, that's for sure. Another team with multiple picks that, similar to 2013, where they're selecting the New York Yankees. And that year the Yankees had three first-round draft picks. They drafted Ian Clarkin. They drafted that year Aaron Judge and Eric Chigailo. Judge right now is tearing it up in, in double-A. Eric Chigailo is having a solid season in double-A. In single-A, I believe, is where Ian Clarkin is. He's still developing. What did the Yankees do with 16 and 30? I'm thinking the Yankees might go with pitching at 16 and then maybe a position player at 30, or they go with two pitchers. Where do you where do you think the Yankees go with their two picks? Well, you know, the Yankees, I think, are definitely going to be drafting a pitcher for one of those picks. I mean, it depends what, what's really left on the board after 15 picks, you know, when they have the 16th pick. Um, you know, I really like their position players right now in the minor leagues. Um, I like Rob Ruff Snyder at second base, who who's, should be up by the end of the year and, and should is looking at to be, the, you know, the next start, starting second base for the Yankees. Um, still has to work on his defense. Um, you know, third base is locked up with Chase Headley, and obviously, as you said, Eric Chigailo or Dante Bichette Jr. Um, Aaron Judge is on the rise. Um, there are a lot of solid prospects position player-wise, so the Yankees really need to focus on pitching, um, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I, I'm going to say that they, you know, a one, one pitcher that, that, that they've been linked to uh, is Cody Ponce from uh, uh, California – Polytechnic Pomona, some school like that. It's from California. Um, but that's what a lot of mock drafts have them take, you know, right-handed starting pitcher with a plus breaking ball, 6'5", 235, really big guy. Um, that would be a solid pick for them. And then, as you said, you know, way down the line uh, at 30, um, I see this draft as really an opportunity for them to get pitching more than position players. Because obviously, as, as you said, this draft is not, one for strong position players. There's really no, no one that stands out above the rest. So um, the Yankees just to get quality pitching, add to their pitching depth, add to their prospect uh, list of, of, of potential you know pitchers for the future. Um, that would be huge. Yeah, and Cody Ponce, he throws 96 miles an hour. He wasn't really a big prospect out of high school when undrafted. Went to Division Two Cal State Paloma, was a reliever. Then he moved into rotation as a sophomore. He had a 1.44 ERA at one point this year, 52.1 innings. He would be the highest-drafted pitcher in the school's history, beating out Mark Wiley, a 40, 46th overall in 1970. As you mentioned, big kid, six foot five, 235 pounds. He sits at 91 to 94 miles an hour with a fastball. There was a cutter, slider, curveball, changeup. He has all the pitches, but the delivery isn't textbook. He needs to repeat it. Needs to throw strikes. That's the one concern. But the Yankees are one of the teams that is interested in Cody Ponce. One thing that you have in this draft, that's three players out of Vanderbilt. Two of them that could go in the top ten. Adley Swanson, as we mentioned about, Carson Fulmer, and then Walker Buehler, who could go probably as a compensation pick. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you can miss it. You can miss Buehler because he is actually a pretty small pitcher. I think about six one. At 170 pounds, doesn't have that big arsenal, but he's been steady for Vanderbilt. Seen him, I think, in the early mock drafts, he was in about a top 10 pick, so he's actually kind of fallen. Same with Ian Happ, who is a second base outfield type guy, a scrappy type of player out of Cincinnati. He's pretty versatile. He could help somebody, no relation to Jay Happ. So there's a lot of useful pieces, a lot of proven college guys, and if you're drafting in a major league draft, do you prefer high school players? Do you prefer college players? What type of player would you look for? And do you think it's a risk taking a high school player, especially a pitcher, so early in the draft? 
Um, I definitely think it's it's a risk to take a high school pitcher without a doubt um, with a high pick in the draft. Obviously, unless they show that they are clearly destined for the big leagues or destined for success. Um, you know, in my opinion, it, it, it's it's really interesting. There are two sides, in my opinion, to, to this debate. I mean, there's on one hand, you draft you draft a 21 year old, you know, out of college or 22, and obviously most players, regardless of their age, have that two, three, four-year window where they're developing in the minor leagues. I mean, to me, it's kind of a toss-up. I mean, are you, do you, how long do you want to have this player? That's kind of my debate or my, my, my struggle with this. Um, you know, a high school player, I also think, also is, is guaranteed to have more, more raw tools, you know, more undeveloped skills that scouts really have to look for and see potential in. I think a college player is 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 closer to to a triple A player really if they're if they're if they're good enough, you know. So you really have an idea of, of what they are and what they're going to be. Um, so I think a high school player, I could argue, has more potential. I think you you, can, you have already seen most of you have seen a good amount out of a college player in a draft. Um, but a high school player has a lot of room for improvement and has a high ceiling, whereas a college player may already be kind of defined and may have already shown their best, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely, because but the only thing that you have, the one problem, if you do draft a college guy, sometimes if they're a little older, they don't have the upside. So if they don't develop quickly enough, but by the time they're drafted at age 21, 22, they're already 25, 26, and they no longer have prospect status. Exactly. That's a bit, that's a bit of a concern with certain guys. You would also don't want the guy too young because then he's going to languish in the minor leagues forever. And then by the time that he does get to 23, 24 years old, you feel like he's been there forever and it's taken him forever to develop. It was like that with Tim Beckham until he finally cracked the big leagues here in 2015. Blade Heathcock took a long time to develop. He was the first-round pick in the 2009 draft to the Yankees after they missed out on Mike Trout, who went four picks before their pick. So sometimes that happens. When you do draft a high school guy like that who doesn't have a lot of experience, Position players, it takes them longer. You can work with them, but when there's a pitcher and he gets injured or something happens with that, you can really be in a very difficult spot if you burn that draft pick on one of those types of pitchers. Houston had that last year with Brady Aiken, as we talked about. It's just such an exciting time, the major league draft. And let's take a look at last year's draft, some of the top players that you had. As I mentioned, Carlos Rodon, he made it to major leagues. Tyler Kolek with the Miami Marlins, still kind of struggling at Greensboro, has a 5 ERA. Nick Gordon, who is Tom Gordon's son, D. Gordon's younger brother, kind of struggling also. And the Midwest League, he's batting 230 last I checked. Aaron Nola for the Philadelphia Phillies, he's already in double A at the Eastern League. You have Michael Conforto, who had a terrific year with the Brooklyn Cyclones last year in short season ball. We talked about short season ball. He's already in double A with Binghamton. Max Pentecost, who hit 324 in 25 games last year. He's supposed to begin the year. In Class A, he had two shoulder operations. Tyler Bede, 2-2, two and 2.24 ERA in the California League. Brandon Finnegan, who we saw last year in the World Series, pitching for the Kansas yep. City Royals. He's in the starting rotation now in AAA. Casey Gillespie with the Tampa Bay Rays in their minor league system. He's with Bowling Green, a 273 average at one point with 339 on base percentage. Had a strong year for the Hudson Valley Renegades in short season ball. Luke Weaver, who's trying to build up some of his arm strength and get ready. He's, he's in the St. Louis Cardinals system. He's in single A. Justice Sheffield, who is Gary Sheffield's kid, 1-1, one 434 ERA with the Cleveland Indians. You had Jack Flaherty with the St. Louis Cardinals, who was a very strong draft last year with a lot of big names. Which one of these guys or which guys really stuck out in that 2014 draft in the first round or any parts of that draft? Well, I think the easy part, easy one to say, obviously, is Brandon Finnegan, uh, what he was able to do in the World Series with the Royals. Um, and I, I think it was pretty big news when he was optioned to AAA before the start of the season. You know, you, you think a guy, a guy, a young guy who had such a big impact in the World Series, you would imagine that he would, he would, he would make the big league club. But obviously, you had to take a step back and then realize before he was pitching in the, in the Major League World Series, he was pitching in the College World Series that same summer. Um, and, you know, he's still only 22. Um, you know, obviously he's doing well in AAA. Um, he'll be back up eventually. So he'll, he'll probably still be quite an impactful player with the Royals. Um, you know, I 
really like the pick of Kyle Schwarber by the Cubs. Um, he has absolutely been raking in uh, in the minors for them. Um, you know, catch catching is, is such a coveted position in baseball, and, and the Cubs are now in Miguel Montero. But obviously, by the time Schwarber's up, you don't expect him to still be there, or at least be starting for them. So Schwarber's power is tremendous. I think he's going to stay a catcher. Hopefully, you really a power rating catcher is, is hard to find, hard hard to come by, and I think the Cubs have that potentially uh, in the next year or two for him to come up. Um, you know, as I said, Michael, as you said, Michael Florida for the Mets, that's a solid pick for them. Tyler Beatty, uh, he has the makings of another San Francisco Giants ace to follow, you know, the lineage of the Linsicums and the Matt Canes and Madison Bumgarners of the world. Um, you know, there's a lot to like in last year's draft. And I'm just, I just wanted to bring up the debate, uh, not a debate, but at least in my opinion, Gersh, I, I want to hear your take on this. Do you feel like these top prospects are being rushed after the success of Mike Trout and Bryce Harper? I'm I'm just hearing all these guys being called up who were drafted just a year or two ago, and they're struggling, and people are labeling them as failures. I look at this specifically with the Boston Red Sox, because everyone is saying Xander Bogarts has been a huge letdown and Jackie Bradley Jr. has been terrible, when both of those guys aren't either, neither of them are 25 yet. Do you think there's kind of some sort of window players have to get? Do you think they have to be developed more? Uh, I don't know what it is. I just feel like I'm hearing all these guys being called up and they're struggling, and these top prospects just fall off the face of the earth because they simply aren't contending for an MVP in their rookie season. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum where you do have a top prospect, and sometimes you have to keep them till mid-June or so, so the arbitration year start a year later. So you have players and some fans and some teams clamoring, why don't you call this guy up? He looks like he's ready. You had the whole thing with Chris Bryant early in the season. Why didn't they call him up? You want to start the arbitration later, but they ended up having to start it a year earlier because they had injuries with Mike Olk going down. So you have so sometimes there's a need. Sometimes there's a necessity where you have to bring somebody up. Carlos Rodon, I think he had maybe about 50 innings in minor league ball, and then they called him up. That was very surprising early on. Brandon Finnegan, obviously, they called him up with the Royals because they were in a pennant race. The Yankees with Jacob Lindgren. I was surprised they called him up. I think maybe they rushed him a little bit because Lindgren still has problems with command. He's pitched okay at the major league level, but the Yankees looked pretty stacked with the bullpen in the minor leagues. You have Nick Rumbelo, you have a couple other guys down there. And so I was, I was a bit surprised that they did rush Lindgren, though was the plan. But yeah, sometimes it's some of it that's pressured. Some of it you have a need, so you have to call somebody up and you have to make that move. I don't think that the Red Sox necessarily rush Xander Bogarts, but he is kind of faltering. I think when they called up Jackie Bradley about a year or two ago, I think that's when they rushed him. He looked like he was a bit overmatched. So sometimes that happens. Sometimes a guy will get off to a fast start, and then he's going to look overmatched because teams start to adjust him. He starts to adjust to his pitches, or they adjust his tendencies at the plate. So there's a lot of adjustment, and so many guys are trying to learn on the major league level. Yeah, I mean, it just I hear so much about it. and In my opinion, I just think Mike Trout and those guys, they're really – uh, once in a generation play. I mean, you have a handful of them, I guess. I guess they're not one at once in a generation, but you know, Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, Strasburg, those guys, in my opinion, are just in such a separate category where they were destined. Maybe not Trout exactly, because Trout obviously burst upon the scene in 2012. I would say Chris but, Bryant. You know, Chris yeah, Bryant Chris was a number two pick. Chris Bryant, uh, you know, Bryce Harper, they were painted and and primed to be these superstars from when they were 17 and 18. You know. So, I mean, guys like that, maybe you do expect a little more out of the younger they are. But, I mean, that's the nature of baseball, that it's, 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 it's a process, and it takes a lot of time to develop a major league player, a pitcher or, or hitter regardless. Um, that's, you know, one of the reasons why, why the MLB draft is so difficult and so interesting and intriguing because these guys, you know, obviously, yes, they will make their professional debuts in single A, or rookie, or you know, the rookie league somewhere. But any of these names that are called tomorrow, more often than not, you're not hearing any of these guys' names announced in the major league stadium for two, three years, if not more, uh, if ever. So it's not one of those guarantees like in an NFL draft or NBA draft that you will see these guys in uniform that next season, in all likelihood. Um, and it, you know. Like the NHL, like you know, MLB, it's it's a real developmental process where you really get the right or the privilege 
to play in the major leagues. You really have to earn it, and you really have to prove it in the minor leagues. You know, getting drafted is – people always say it, and, it's, you know, it's it's poetic, but it's it's really the start of your career. It's not a stepping stone. It's really the beginning of everything. And this year we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of that beginning for so many players, the 50th anniversary of the Major League Draft. You talked about guys who went from the draft immediately into the Major Leagues. It's, it's a very short list. The most recent you could think of is Mike Leak. Xavier Nady actually did that. One at bat he had with the San Diego Padres in 2000. You had David Clyde in the 1970s with the Texas Rangers. That was kind of a publicity stunt. They bring up this 18-year-old kid. Never really amounts to anything. Never reaches the promise. Pete and Cavillia, who had a decent career as an outfielder. Jim Abbott, who pitched a no-hitter for the Yankees, was on an Olympic team. John Olerud, who played for the Mets, played for the Toronto Blue Jays. So you don't you had a couple of guys that made it to the major leagues right out of right out of the draft. Dave Winfield was another who ended up going to the Hall of Fame. But that's usually the exception rather than the rule. But 1965 was when the Rule Four draft started. Before that, teams could just sign anybody. If you had the money, you would just you see a player, 16, 17 years old, you see him out in the sandbox somewhere, hey, I'll sign him. Four teams try to compete for that. If you're the Yankees, if you're the Dodgers, if you're someone with financial flexibility, guess what? You're going to sign that guy, and it created some bidding wars. And remember, this is before free agency. Baseball tried to put in a bonus rule to try to prevent that. So you have to put the guy on the big league roster in some way so they don't stockpile some of these guys. But it was at the winter meetings in 1964 because the Angels bid $200,000 on a player, Rick Reichardt, who signed with them, that it drove up the pricing. Teams, except for the Cardinals, the Mets, the Yankees, they all were in favor of a, of a big league draft to try to basically emulate what the NFL did with Burt Bell when he was commissioner in the 30s to have a, have a draft in reverse order of the standing. kind of created the idea of tanking because teams with the worst records would pick first. And Rick Monday was the first ever pick in the 1965 draft. Monday was drafted by the Oakland A's. He was from out of Arizona State, ended up going to the Dodgers. His most famous moment was at Olympic Stadium in the 1981 League Championship Series. It's a home run off Steve Rogers. Ends up winning the game for the Dodgers when the Expos are up two games to one. The Expos proceed to lose game five and they never get back to the postseason again, the beginning of the end, potentially for baseball in Montreal. And so right off the start, Blue Monday, that was the top pick in the 1965 draft. And then you started to see certain trends. 1966 draft, Monday's teammate out of Arizona State, Reggie Jackson, second pick in the draft, not the first. The New York Mets had the first pick. They take a catcher by the name of Steve Chilcott, Injured his shoulder in his second minor league season, spent seven years in the minor leagues, never makes it to the big leagues, becomes the first of three guys not to make it to the major leagues. And Reggie Jackson, as you know, Brian, became Mr. October. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's so much history to the draft. Um, as, as a fan of this player um, in general, just throughout his career, I'm just always fascinated by the fact that, I mean, obviously there were, there were reasons for this. Um, but Albert Pujols was drafted 402nd overall in the 1999 Major League Baseball draft in the 13th round. Um, people did not know about his age. People questioned his, his age and his true ability. Um, but that pick right there, I mean, to see the career he, he ended up having, I mean, that has to be one of the biggest, um, I wouldn't say snubs, but one of the biggest moments in the draft where, you know, it's not about the top pick. It's about what you find and the depth you find later on in the draft. Um, you know, it's it's just not always about these top ten picks. You, you might you might see tomorrow night the next the, the the next singular superstar in baseball be drafted in the twentieth round. You just have no idea what to expect from these guys. And it's almost like fool's gold when you do draft the guy in the first round. I mentioned about Steve Chilcott over Reggie Jackson, which now looks like a no brainer. But Whitey Herzog, who is the, who is actually in the Mets scouting department, ended up becoming the Cardinal manager later on. He was real, very high on Steve Chilcott. The Mets did not have a catcher at the time. They figured he was going to be that franchise guy. Maybe that guy was going to lead him to the World Series. Ended up being Jerry Grody, who they ended up trading for because Chilcott took forever to develop. And then you had a couple of other guys who just never got to the big league. 1991, the Yankees coming off a 67-95 and season. 
They end up firing Stump Merrill at the end of the 91 season. Things are falling apart every which way in New York. They end up drafting Brian Taylor, who is this top pitcher out of high school, left-hander. Everybody thinks he's going to be the guy that's going to be the next guy to lead the Yankees' rotation and lead them back to that promised land. Does not work out for him. Manny Ramirez was in that draft. The Yankees could have had him, a Washington Heights product. Other guys were in that draft that they could have had, but they ended up going with Brian Taylor. Taylor gets injured in a bar fight in the 1993 offseason, loses eight miles an hour off his fastball. By the time he reaches 30 years old, he's out of baseball. He ends up going to prison for cocaine possession and other legal issues. Matt Bush, a similar situation in 2004. The Padres are basically forced to draft. Then Jared Weaver and Stephen Drew, who are among the top picks along with Justin Verlander, are not going to be able to be signed because they're represented by Scott Boers. Right. Another problem that you had with Brian Taylor. Taylor wanted a big signing bonus, $1.55 million he ended up getting. And he really didn't amount to anything. And the Padres were fearful of something, something similar to that because the signing bonuses were getting a bit out of control. Mark Teixeira got a big signing bonus, I think, in 98 draft. And then you had J.D. Drew. He got a pretty big one, about $10 million. So it was getting out of control. And it was at the time where teams were looking at signability. And you saw teams like the Pittsburgh Pirates doing that. They would take Brian Bowington. They wouldn't take a B.J. Upton. They wouldn't take a Zach Greinke in 2002. They ended up taking Bowington. And the same thing with Matt Bush. They tried to convert him into a pitcher, played for three different teams. He was involved in a hit and run. He's currently in prison. So you have Brian Taylor and Matt Bush in prison. They should probably be in the same cell as two guys that never made it to the major leagues after being drafted first overall. But all laughing aside, they, they pretty much ruined their careers, pretty much ruined their lives because they really had nothing to fall back on after baseball. And just a cautionary tale of how precious and also – privilege it is to be drafted and how nothing comes easy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it just it, the road to Major League Baseball is, is just so difficult and and few people really realize it. I mean, you know, once you get get there, it's the idea that you know you get paid millions and millions of dollars to play a children's game, um, and it's such an easy life and such a nice life. But to get to that point requires more work than and most people could ever imagine hours in the batting cage, hours and hours and hours of bus rides and terrible meals and cheap hotels and motels and the minor leagues. As you know, and obviously it, it, it's no longer kind of a joke. It's actually obviously a problem with the way the minor leagues are treated and and the, how much money they make and the conditions in which they have to travel and, and such. But you know, it's really it is a long road until you get to those Ritz Carltons and the big paychecks and. Yeah, and there's no guarantee we ever even make it. That's why baseball and the Major League Baseball draft is so precious because, you know, you know, many are. I mean, just I, I forgot the saying, but you know, uh, it, it ends with few are chosen. You know, many are, many are, many are picked, or many, you know, but few are chosen to really get to the major league. Many are taken, few are chosen. That is it. Thank you. Yeah, yep. and it's just, it's just an example. Of, of how tough it is to play Major League Baseball and how tough up a road, you know, tomorrow night is, is just the very, very beginning of a long, long stretch that many players hope will end with them in the Major Leagues, but the likelihood of that happening is very, very slim. And we talked about Albert Pools being a 13th round pick. It just, it, there's a lot of luck involved. The player landing in the right spot. That has to happen with the right team. Teams pass up on people for some reason. 23 teams passing up on Mike Trout. Randall Gritchick was taken ahead of him with the Angels having back-to-back picks. Nobody knew what they had with him. One of my favorite stories with the 1990 draft, the Atlanta Braves, they were developing all these all these young pitchers, John Small, Tom Glavin, Steve Avery, Pete Smith, and they see this guy, this high school pitcher, Todd Van Poppel, 11-2. He's a Texas kid. A big right-hander looks like he's going to be the guy. He tells general manager Bobby Cox, I'm not signing with Atlanta. There's no way I'm going to sign with him. And the Braves are really high on this guy. They really thought he was going to be the guy. Their fallback option is a kid named Larry Wayne Jones, third baseman out of Atlanta, Florida. They end up taking him, and he ends up becoming the most celebrated switch hitter in baseball since Mickey Mantle. And Todd Van Poppel spent 15 years in the big leagues but has a 6 ERA and never becomes the pitcher that everybody thought he was going to be. So there are stories like that, and sometimes in the draft, people talk to me about this, and a lot of people always talk about, do you draft your need? Do you draft, oh, you need a shortstop? 
Do you draft for that, or do you go with the best player available? In the baseball draft, because it takes so long for these guys to develop, you have to go with the player that is the best fit for you, the best player available, not the guy that you just stick in a position because, hey, I need a first baseman, I need a mm-hmm. catcher, therefore I have to draft him. In the 1992 draft, in that draft, Hal Newhauser was a scout for the Houston Astros. He wants this kid out of Kalamazoo, Michigan, by the name of Derek Jeter. So like 17, 18 years old, thinks, most people think he's going to go to Michigan, so they, they're not going to sign him. He tells the Astros, you, you guys got to get this guy. Craig Vigio, we just acquired Jeff Bagwell, we have Luis Gonzalez, Steve Finley, Shane Reynolds, Daryl Kyle. We have a young team that's about to, about to form everything going our way. You have to draft this guy. They decide, you know what, we're not going to develop this type of shortstop. And they end up getting Phil Nevin, who's a third baseman. His son is actually in this draft. We'll talk about some of the players, famous players, their sons and in this draft. And Derek Jeter was passed up. At that time, by Houston, they took the more proven guy. He was a college guy on a Cal State forward team. Phil Nevin made one all-star team. Other teams passed on him. You had the Cleveland Indians taking Paul Shuey. You had the Montreal Expos taking B.J. Wallace because they thought he was easier to sign. You had <clears throat> Jeffrey Hammond taken by the Baltimore Orioles because the Orioles had a shortstop already in Cal Ripken. And then the Cincinnati Reds are in that draft at number five. So what are the Reds going to do? They have Barry Larkin at shortstop. There's a lot of rumors that they're going to take Derek Jeter anyway. Jim Bowden, the general manager, says, no, we, we have Barry Larkin. He's coming off the world championship in 1990. We're not taking him. They end up taking an outfielder named Chad Matola. Doesn't have that many at-bats above AAA in the major leagues. And I think he was a hitting coach in the Toronto Blue Jays organization. The next pick is number six by the New York Yankees. And Yankee scout Dick Roach <laughs> saw this guy in Michigan he told Bill Lively, who was a scout for the Yankees, after Lively said, oh, he's not going to sign. He's going to go to Michigan. He said, this kid's not going to Michigan. He's going to Cooperstown. And I, and I, and I think Grouch was pretty right on the ball on that one. But it took that much luck because the Yankees, they really wanted their Jeter. He was the guy that they wanted, but they thought it's not very feasible. You have, you have the Expos. Maybe, maybe they'll take a chance at him. They end up not doing it. You have the Orioles. They, could take it. they take Jeffrey Hammonds, who has a big league career later on. And then it's the Reds, who were really looking at him and Chad Matola. They end up taking Chad Matola, and that could have really changed the course of events because who knows what happens, because maybe you move Derek Jeter to second base. Maybe he doesn't become the player who ends up becoming in just circumstance, just like with Chipper Jones with Todd Van Poppel. Wherever these guys come, whatever team they go to, it's really the luck of the draw. It's really circumstance, especially at the top part of the major league draft. Yeah, I mean, you know, I – Heard this over and over again in my U.S. history class, but it's true that nothing happens in isolation. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but truly, though, I mean, the everything has a chain reaction to it. And uh, as you said, with, with Jeter and, and how, how that, that moment especially, that's probably going to be one of the biggest moments in draft history when all is said and done. Um, but, uh, you know, truly, I mean, tonight, tomorrow night, you know, Monday night, the round one of the draft, um, there's a chance that, that a franchise has changed forever for the good or for the very bad. I mean, you know, we'll know in a few years, but um, it, it's just really exciting because it, it's like we're on the precipice of, of you know, something so big and something amazing that we have no idea what it even is going to be. And we talk so much about the teams on the precipice and the players on the precipice are doing something special and how every move is scrutinized. It's, one team fails to make, they make the wrong draft pick. They draft a Brian Taylor or a Todd Van Poppel. They could be fired just for making that move because some other guy ends up developing and he becomes an all-star and then he beats them later on. You look at that, how come the Major League draft does not get the same appeal as the NBA, the NHL draft, even when you hear about Connor McDavid and Jack Eichel for the past year, or the NFL draft with Winston and Marcus Mariota, so much going on. There's, there's so much interest in drafts all over the place, and you hear about these prospects. Why why isn't it the same in baseball? How come even with all the advancements and everything that's gone on, how come the major league draft languishes in popularity behind each of the major sports? Well, I think one of the biggest reasons has to be that college baseball is just not popular um, uh, nationally, I guess, on a televised I mean, you know, we all tune in to watch the NCAA tournament uh, with basketball. We all watch the bowl games with college football. Um, 
and we see these guys the entire season or even season prior to their them entering the draft. You know, we have known about um, – we we knew about Marcus Mariota, you know, uh, two years ago. We knew about Jameis Winston two years ago. Um, we, you know, in basketball, Kyrie Irving, all these guys, Kemba Walker, LeBron James, obviously, we knew about, you know, when, when they were just playing in high school and they were on a cover of Sports Illustrated. Baseball, uh, baseball players, college players are not only not as publicized, but also I think baseball is a sport where, not to diminish the other sports, and you have to have a bunch of skills for every other sport, of course. But baseball is one of those sports where we have seen time and time again where top picks don't turn out, and also top picks don't make it, still don't make it to the majors for a few years. You know, there's the excitement level of knowing that um, Marcus Mariota is going to be on the field week one this season, you know, in the NFL. We know that um, – uh, we knew that when LeBron James was drafted, he was going to be the center of the cap. You know, not the center in the position, but like the, 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 the you know the center of the Cavaliers organization and their future. Um, with baseball, it's just it's such a crapshoot this draft and every single year. And um, I think it's it's a part of it is due to the popularity of college baseball that it's simply not fair. Even though the College World Series is going on now, I mean, I bet if you ask the average Major League Baseball fan. They probably haven't watched more than an inning of it. Um, Meanwhile, people will be glued to the TV all March for March Madness. So so I think it's a matter of popularity, and also I think it's a matter of baseball is one of those sports where you can't just translate from college to Yankee Stadium and just be be the same player you were. It takes a lot of development, a lot of years, a lot of training. Um, So baseball, it's a draft of patience, and, you know, it's not – you don't run out, you know, last year – Astros fans hopefully didn't run out and get Brady Aiken jerseys, <laughs> you know. Um, the, you know, I mean, the, you know, the same way that you know fans went out and run, ran and got out uh, Mariota jerseys, you know, Titans jerseys and Titans fans. It's just, it's just, it's a draft that, that you know, the the results of this draft, the you know, you're not going to see for a few years. It's not going to be like you'll know instantaneously at the end of the night that your team has just gotten better because you you really don't. Have, you really have no idea. That's 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 the main thing with me with the MLB draft. You just don't know. And baseball has really tried to make some strides to make this thing more visible. It used to be you would hear so many stories of guys getting drafted. They would be standing by the phone all day, or they would go out and their parents would say, oh, you got drafted by the Tigers. You got drafted by the Indians. Congratulations. And your number would be almost like a social security number, or like, some, or like let's say one of your passwords on Twitter would be something like, Eight five four three and then eight six seven five three zero nine. But yeah, it would be something like that. It's basically, how the player would be labeled, and the major league draft was not televised. Two thousand seven was the first time that the draft was televised. In ESPN two, David Price was the first pick, and then in two thousand nine, MLB Network started broadcasting it. That was the year Mike Trout was drafted. That was the year Dustin Ackley was drafted. Steven Strasburg with the first overall pick, and then it started to gain some visibility. And then MLB dot com started broadcasting it on their website, and so there was some interest, but it just doesn't have the overall popularity in the cachet, and I don't know if Major League Baseball, if they can do that, because to try to make it more popular and, and try to influence minor league baseball, they're trying to do that with some TV contracts, and maybe perhaps college, because I'm not sure if they can, because they're competing with themselves, and it's just a, it's a very fragile situation to do that, but there seems to be more interest now than there was in previous years. Yeah, and I mean, also, it's just it's the simple fact that you can't guarantee that any of these guys will even make, see the field. You know, in, in other drafts, you know that these guys are going to make an impact immediately on the major league team or the professional team at the, at the highest level in most cases. Um, I, I do agree it's gotten more popular. I think it's great that it's televised. I couldn't believe – I really – it's amazing to think how it, it wasn't for so long, um, and that, that really – probably put the draft at, at a disadvantage as much as its general popularity has. Um, you know, I think uh, the draft is going gonna, is gonna, to, I mean, keep keep growing. Um, it's interesting. I'm looking forward to tonight, uh, tomorrow night. Just as someone who just is intrigued by change in general, um, this will be the first draft, obviously, that Rob Manfred steps to the podium and not Bud Selig in, you know, over 20 years. So that's going to be pretty interesting to see. Um, you know, we've had a lot of changing of the guards with commissioners around professional sports. So 
obviously his first year for Rob Manfred, and um, it, it, it's a new start, really. I mean, obviously, you know, he, he has he has become a clear advocate for increasing the pace of play and getting more people into baseball, and, um, you know, no, no, there's no better time, really, um, besides the World Series, really, to get people into baseball and get youth into baseball than to look at this MLB draft, look at these 18-, 19-year-olds drafted, and look at how relatable they are and, and, and look at, you know, the tough road they're going to have to get to the majors. That's, that's really amazing to follow. I mean, if you look at some of the most famous guys here, some of their, some of their sons here, you got Daz Cameron, who's the son of Mike Cameron, Drew Finley, who's the, who's the son of David Finley, the Dodgers VP of scouting, Cam Gibson, the son of Kurt Gibson's in this draft, Cabrian Hayes, the son of former major leaguer Charlie Hayes, who caught the final out in the 96 World Series, the godson of Tom Gordon's in this draft. David Lucroy is the brother of Jonathan Lucroy. Quentin Mack, who's a nephew of Shane Mack, who was in the 91 World Series with the Twins. Tate Matheny, who's the son of Cardinals manager Mike Matheny, the son of Jamie Moyer, Hutton Moyer. So many different famous names out there. There's really a lot for everybody in this draft. The Arizona Diamondbacks are on the clock, and I guess we're off the clock now. So thanks for joining us here on this edition of the Cleanup Spot presented by Baseball Essential. You can follow us at BB underscore Essential on Twitter www.baseballessential.com. You can follow me on my personal account at Gersh Online. You can follow Brian Danoff at Brian Danoff. For Brian Danoff, my name is Gershon Rabinowitz. Time to say goodbye. We will talk to you soon on the cleanup spot.